thanks for coming tonight, all of you. We're a loaded house. <laughs> uh, I'm Fire Chief Matt Miller with the City of Hope Wim, and I uh, appreciate everybody coming out tonight. We're, if you came to the last public forums that we had uh, the previous time, uh, we had a much longer presentation. We shortened it way down so that you guys can ask questions. Uh, so along with me here tonight, we have the Avenue Fire Chief Dave Golding, the Aberdeen Assistant Fire Chief Ryan O'Dell, the Cosmopolis Fire Chief Nick Valley, and the Hope Lamb Finance Director Corey Schmidt. So we should be able to answer any question that comes up. And like I said, uh, this, this presentation, we've really slimmed it down just to give some overhead information and, and encourage questions. So as you go, if you have a question, please ask, and we will attempt and try to answer everything we can. So, I'll get going. What is a regional fire authority? So it's a special purpose district that municipalities can form to con consolidate different departments, two different, or multiple in this case, different departments. Uh, we're a little bit different, uh, like with fire districts. Fire districts can merge uh, into adjoining fire districts. Whereas municipalities coming together, one of the options is a regional fire authority. Another one, it would be a municipal fire authority. That is an option that was presented. However, it's untried in the state of Washington, and we don't want to be guinea pigs. Uh, real quick, before we get too far, I also want to point out, uh, we have Central Grace Harbor Regional Firefighters Local 315 President Ryan Klein and Vice President Derek Jensen here as well. So if anybody has any questions aimed towards the union, they'd be happy to answer. So again, uh, the Regional Fire Authority just lets us combine two or three city municipalities into one organization. And why are Regional Fire Authority? So economies of scale is a big one. Uh, one of the things that we've been trying to share with everybody is that uh, one, of the, one of the things you can look at is right now in Hope Wim, we go through a lot of gloves, right? Gloves are one-time disposable use, and sometimes depending on the call, we might go to each person two or three pairs of gloves. And if I'm buying a case of gloves for $100, and Dave is buying a case of gloves for $100, and Nick is buying a case of gloves for $100, we're spending a lot of money where if we can take advantage of the Costco effect of buying bulk, that's going to reduce those costs for items such as that. And that goes into play for fire engines. Uh, fire engines are very expensive, they're a very specialized piece of equipment, they're not getting any cheaper, and currently, uh, there are rules, regulations, WACs, RCWs, NFPA standards across the board, across the state, across the nation that dictate how we operate and what we should have and for equipment and reserve equipment. So we are supposed to have a reserve engine for every 10 engines we have. Well, in Hope Wim, I have two engines. One's right there, one's right parked in the alley. And if you see back in the corner, that's my reserve. I have to have that as a reserve in case one of these two break down. Dave has to have the same in his station. Nick has to have the same in his station. So between all of us, we've got to combine five engines, six, and three reserves. Well, as a whole entity, we don't need three reserves. So that helps us reduce the amount of engines we have to buy over time. That goes along with ambulances. We have to have backup ambulances as well. So over time, there's not going to be an immediate, uh, immediate notice of the engines and the ambulances, but over time we wouldn't have to buy as many because we can spread them around and we wouldn't have to have as many reserves. Uh, it would increase the amount of firefighters we have on emergency scenes. This was another big one that we talked about is uh, NFPA sets standards for firefighting and they say that on a typical residential structure fire, you, we are supposed to have 15 to 17 firefighters on scene. And currently, Hopewim has five on duty at one time, Aberdeen has nine on duty. Obviously, individually, we can't accomplish that. Together, we are getting closer to that. Uh, Cosmopolis currently has five volunteers, so they're having difficulty reaching that goal as well. 
together the RFA would combine all three cities and give all three cities more access to those increased fire ramps. Uh, adjusting resources based on high risk areas, we can start analyzing our call data and realize what areas of the three cities have a higher call volume. And do we need to move our people amongst the five stations within the RFA to handle that call volume? Uh, leveraging the strengths of each agency, we're just going to build on top of each other and, and take what the strengths are of each, each department and keep building that as much as we possibly can. Uh, creating equity across the tax base. Later tonight, Corey will talk about the funding mechanisms. But this would make a, an even keel across all three cities uh, so that somebody who lives in Hopewim is paying the same amount as somebody who lives in Aberdeen as somebody who's living in Cosmopolis. And it's just going to set the tax base equal across all three cities. And then a big one for us is recruitment and retention. Right now, Dave and myself are struggling to recruit new paramedics and new EMTs and firefighters because it's very difficult for us to compete with the I-5 corridor. Up there right now, they can, if somebody were to, to test between me and them, they're going to make more money up there. And they're going to work half as much. Um, they have more firefighters to spread the call volume out. And they're just bigger communities that have more money that allows those firefighters to get paid more. And, and we're struggling to recruit people to come and test for us and get hired with us and to keep people. Uh, over the last five years, between the two of us, what would you say we have lost? Combined 10, 11 people, oh, 10, 10, to 12. 10 to 12 people that unfortunately, they come down here, we train them, we teach them, they become good firefighters, they become good paramedics and EMTs, and then they can go test for somewhere else and go leave and make more money and work out as much. Uh, so we believe that as a larger agency, the call volume is still going to be up there. The manpower isn't going to be, or the staffing won't increase that much in this current plan. But we believe as a larger agency there will be benefits and, what's the word I'm looking for, opportunities for people to either advance or go down a special niche or have an opportunity to just grow inside the fire authority and become, uh, just become more attractive to them to come here and stay here. And is that working? All right, so uh, what you're going to see tonight is we're all just going to take turns and go through all this because I'm sure you guys don't want to listen to me talk for 20 minutes to a half hour. So I'm going to hand this over to Nick and let him go to the next slide. Sounds good. So a big question that we've been getting a lot is what's changed since the last plan. So Aberdeen and Hopewim have previously gone brought this to the voters two previous times. Um, the biggest noticeable change on the outside, at least for us, is that addition of Cosmopolis. So last year when Aberdeen and Hopewim decided to um, to go at it again and start the conversations, they invited the city of Cosmopolis to the table to start asking if they'd be interested. And in September of last year. Uh, the Cosmopolis City Council voted to officially join the planning process. So with that, Cosmopolis has volunteers, and Aberdeen and Hopewim do not have volunteers. So in the reworking of the plan, we had to rewrite the plan to include volunteers and to keep um, the Cosmopolis Fire Station open as the fifth station on RFA, being a predominantly volunteer fire department, at least to begin with. Um, additionally, we have adjusted the funding mechanisms. Um, Corey's going to talk very specific about what that looks like um, on the next slide. We've also changed the government slightly. So since now there are three cities instead of just the two, um, we can't do before. The previous plan had a, a commissioner elected from the city of Hopewim, a commissioner elected from the city of Aberdeen, and then one at large. Now that there's three and we have such different populations, all three commissioners are going to be elected at large between the three cities, and they'll be on staggered term, or, yeah, staggered terms, of two year, four year, and six year for their initial terms. That way, it's um, it's a cycle every six years going on after that. We've also um, slightly changed the transfer of assets. This is mostly the city of Cosmopolis. We recently had the um, the police department move in while their new building is being constructed. 
So it changed the, the verbiage in the plan now states that as far as the stations themselves go, each city is going to negotiate that out with the RFA once it is formed to make sure that uh, we're covering the city's interest with their assets, but also planning for the RFA for the future. And, um, and that's all. commissioners to run this uh, RFA. 
So those uh, elections would happen in the general election in November. Uh, and then the RFA would actually start operating January 1 of 24. So we have our commissioners, uh, commissioners in place, January 1, 24. Aberdeen, Hokan, Cosmopolis Fire Departments, in essence, will cease to exist and be, they all get pulled into the Central Grace Harbor Bar. All right, that's it. <coughs> like I said, we're trying to make it quick so that we can have questions. So, not a lot of you here, but we got a lot of time to answer questions. If anybody has any specific ones, shoot. We'll try to hit it from every angle. What's the percentage of response you make to that? Down you know, you know, you know, how much people The percentage? Oh, yeah, I live in an area where I see a lot of angles in the state of the Yeah, I, you know, I can't tell you a natural percentage when my mind's not going to work that fast, but I can tell you that year to date, I am roughly 140 or so responses. That, that, no, not a total. Year to date, total. 140 that has been attached to that yeah, one doesn't have to Since January 1st? Yeah, yeah, January, February, and basically. Yeah. So, right, roughly right. Question on the question on, so when this thing gets voted on, is there such a thing as Aberdeen and Polk plan and vote on it and get a percentage of votes and maybe causing it to come up with that? Votes. It's the total votes. It, it, so there is a potential that all of Aberdeen with their higher population could outvote Cozzy and Hopeland together. It, it could happen that way. It, Aberdeen just has the higher population than all three, you know, even Cozzy and, and Hopeland combined, I believe, right? Yeah, we're, Aberdeen's higher. So technically, if every person in Aberdeen voted yes, it could outnumber the other two cities. Or vice versa. Or vice versa. They could, you know, they could all vote no. Avenue and Cosy could vote yes. And they could not. Staffing will change. Staffing will not change. You actually will. Sorry, let me take that back. So I think Nick briefly mentioned this. Uh, stations will not be shut down. So Hopeland has two fire stations. Avenue has two fire stations. Cosy has one fire station. We're keeping all five fire stations. They're all going to stay where they are. Um, we will not be losing anybody. The goal, and Corey kind of touched on it with the ambulance utility fee, haven't had the question yet, so I'm going to bring up the answer anyway, is the increase in the monthly water ambulance, or excuse me, not water, ambulance utility fee that comes along with water and sewer was projected to go up to $50, which is an increase for all three cities. With that, it's an increase of four personnel to the fire department. Uh, back in 2018-19, Aberdeen and Hopewim had a feasibility study done, and at that point, it said that combined, we are down 10 firefighters of what we should have. So with that, we aren't hitting that 10, we're shooting for four. Um, as some of you are aware from the last time we tried to run this, we, the, the, there was the charge that was even higher but we were trying to reach seven firefighters to help offset that, that call volume and per person that we have. The, one of the biggest things that we got that feedback on was is that the price is too high. So with that, we scaled this back and took out, which, and I hate saying this word because I don't want it to be repeated because we're not using it, is the fire benefit charge. That is gone. We are not using that. It, it, was, it was not an acceptable mechanism. So we stuck with what we, all three cities have now is the basic dollar fifty per thousand assessed valuation that the cities all collect now. It's just going to be turned over to the RFA, and then all three cities pay a monthly ambulance utility fee now. That will be not increased by fifty dollars, but increased to fifty dollars. That's a correct answer. Oh. I'm going to say that's a very rough estimate. What that is, is I took the 2023 budgets for Hopewood, Aberdeen, and Causey. I included the four additional people, and I figured out what the cost could be. 
And so based upon 2023 budget figures plus the four additional people, that makes the cost on the ambulance availability fee to be around $50 uh, per month. So please keep in mind that is a budgeted figure. Um, I also want to say that Hope right now, we're doing an ambulance availability or utility fee study, and at a minimum, they want us to, they say that we should increase our utility rate to $55 a month, and that was at a minimum. They jumped it up for, to like $5 every year for the next several years. So, please, I mean, I don't mean to sound harsh, but costs are going to go up regardless, just because the ambulance the EMS services provided by each city aren't sustainable the way that they're currently functioning. So, it's costs are going to go up regardless, just to give everybody a heads up. I did do a review on senior citizen discounts, and if the governing board decides to offer that, that is available and that is doable for the RFA. On the ambulance availability fee. And then the county uh, assessor's office does offer a senior citizen discount for property taxes as well. So unfortunately, the costs are going up for all, you know, for everything, obviously. We all know that. And we understand that it's already being, citizens are already being hit, being hit hard on multiple fronts. Um, and we are being hit hard on that as well. Fuel costs, EMS supplies, fire equipment, everything is going up for us as well. And we're, we're trying to make this as sustainable and efficient as we can. And like I said, we, we have some potential cost savings for the future. We could do the Costco effect, not have to buy as much equipment, but it all still is going up for us. And like Corey said, the initial report that we got back for just the city of Hope Wim's ambulance utility fee is that it needs to go up even higher to cover start covering our costs. Um, we are coming down, trying to bring it down to that 50-ish level across the board and trying to keep it at a minimum as the best we can. So if you got the $50 from the EMS, in addition, how, how much is it going to cost to run the whole operation? And Corey, um, I'll let her answer that. How much in addition? So it'll be the dollar fifty ambulance availability fee, or sorry, the dollar fifty per one thousand on your property taxes, right. and then the fifty dollars or whatever it ends up being for the ambulance availability fee that will be coming out of the citizens. So, or, or are you asking what's the total budget? Uh, or are you asking what the total budget looks like? You know, well, cost. Yeah, well, for, for the homeowners and stuff. Okay. Okay. For sure. Fifty one. Yeah. To, to look at that, I mean, because so the property tax is not going to be. An so are you in Hope Morality? Okay. okay. So the property tax is not going to be an increase. Um, you're currently paying that dollar fifty one thousand per one thousand. That'll be to, taken away from the city and given to the RFA. That was going to the county. No. It, it's, it, well, well, you pay it to the county, but a portion of that goes to the city. Right. And then that city portion will be allocated so that a dollar fifty of what you're paying the city goes to the RFA. So. Your property taxes shouldn't be increasing. Um, yeah, so the, the only increase is going to be to that the, the monthly water bill availability. You're coming the water bill. That's going to go up. Yeah, that's going to go up. So it's a property for us, it's $27.96 a month. That'll go up $22 some odd dollars to, to, to the 50 so And that's, that's going to go up in 2024. It's not going to go up incrementally. It, honestly, it'll probably look, be looked at every year. So once the RFA is established... I'm just saying, the, the initial one's going to be a jump of yes, almost $20. Right. Yes, yeah. you are correct. So, um, yes. For people on fixed income. Correct. So with that, please keep in mind... So are we going to start looking at... Can I finish my comment, please? I'm okay. trying to finish my question. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So does that mean we're going to try and look into some cost savings systems, like if Cosmopolis is using volunteers? Why can't Aberdeen and Hopewim use some? So the volunteers are incorporated into the plan. And then a lot of the cost saving measures are very similar to what Matt had, Chief Miller had discussed on the economies of scale, how when we buy like, for instance, like medical supplies, when you're buying in bulk versus just a set amount, you can save money that way. 
I, I understand that. I'm just, that's a huge jump a year for a lot of our people that are on fixed incomes. And we're not, we're, we're aware. And it's, it's a frustrating thing across the board. That's a little beyond frustrating. Okay. Um, so with that, so the RFA will also have to do an ambulance availability fee study to back what they're going to be charging the citizens um, once it's established. The study does take a while, as we're experiencing, but there will be a national study that will set the rates and create a formula as to how the fees will come out to the citizens. So we're guessing. I said it was an estimate. Right now she's going off of today's 2023 figures to say what that is. That's what that number came from for today. What, what, what kind of money comes back for a EMS run that somebody has a uh, Blue Cross and, and Medicare? Uh, uh, not a lot. Not very much. Not a lot. A couple hundred dollars maybe? Yes, so Medicare, typically it's around $180, $200 if you're on Medicare. What they would you pick up and it's going down the money like the camp down there. Okay. Mm -hmm. What does that have to come from for those people? Pretty much from Medicare, Medicaid. Medicare, yes. Medicaid. 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 Yeah, usually Medicaid in those instances. And that is a challenge we have locally is we kind of do our pyramids of the citizens we serve, what type of insurance they have. Um, and most of our uh, patients have either Medicare and or Medicaid. Are those people that are on the street too? Uh, yes, yeah. Um, and they don't pay well. You know, we don't have a population that has really good health insurance that pays. So we struggle with, you know, the rate of return on our billing. You know, as Corey pointed out there, what we're able to collect from Medicaid and Medicare does not cover the cost of the service. And we cannot do what they call balance billing for those patients, meaning whatever Medicare doesn't pay, where Medicaid doesn't pay, we can't go out for the rest of it. We have to write them off. So we're, you know, it's just, it's a struggle for us to be able to maintain the level of service that you know the citizens have historically been able to get without raising fees. And it's it's not sustainable the way it is today. You know, we, something has to give. Either increasing fees to help the service be able to sustain or no increase, and then we've got to take a hard look at what do we offer? What can we do? What services do we have to cut to stay at a much lower level? So. What is it <clears throat> cost per run if, if you're a your paying department and, and, and uh, benefits and everything that are here to go on a run? What is that? Uh, you're paying the, the, the money anyhow. So if, if you don't incorporate that into the run, how much is, how much is that? Last time I calculated out was a few years ago. It was around 1900 so I would guess now it's probably 21 to 2200 Depending on the location of the call. For a run? <laughs> how, how can it be done? You're going to think of wear and tear on the vehicle, so there's a set mileage rate, um, and then the, the medical supplies, and then... Is that what you're asking? And then yeah. the, sta and then the staff mean, as well. I mean, your wages, if you never went to run, you're still paying. Correct. You got it. Right. Okay, so, <clears throat> yes, you go on a run, and, and I understand it's going to take some more supplies and, and some stuff, but it also makes how much is that? On an average per run, okay. two thousand dollars. That's it. It's still two thousand yeah. dollars above and beyond all the wages and everything in the end. So, oh, are you asking? Oh, above, above and beyond. Oh, above and beyond. Yeah. I, I guess just a ballpark. I just took my annual budget, seventy-three, and averaging, which is, I just used eight million. I'm, I'm like, I think I have eight point three million. Yeah. But I just of eight million. What I'm doing this year. Last year's call volume is 6,200 runs for Aberdeen. If you did it like a run compared to your budget, yeah. I'm at $1,300 per run. This is what it costs the city. If you looked at it in that, you know, that's a very simple way to do it. 
Now, getting into the actual true cost of time, fuel, wear and tear, supplies, that's, boy, that's a tough one to figure out. And that's a brain power of it. I'm going to try to do the math right now, so just give me a minute. Oh, yeah. so, but, but that gives you kind of an idea. I mean, that, that's above and beyond the wages and benefits. That includes wages and benefits. That's my entire fire and EMS budget is eight million. Yeah. I think what he's trying to ask is what does the actual run cost without people? That is hard because to you're already because, you're, because you're already getting paid, and he's curious yeah. what the run cost. Yeah, I don't have those numbers on top. I, I just understood you. Right? So I, yeah, I don't know exactly either. But if you figure that, uh, let's use a chest pain call. Okay. There's, you can't use an average call because if we go to somebody with a uh, possible broken ankle, we may not do anything for them besides just give them a ride to the hospital. Right. And that happens a lot. Right. Versus uh, well, a chest pain patient. Oh, so actually, let's go with a CPR patient. Right. I'm going to take the extreme the other way, right? So we have nothing to a CPR when you take into account medication that we give. So I'm going to look to the paramedics. How many different par medicines would we oh, give? I can them? step up and just say what's yeah. the price. How many different uh, medicines would we give on a CPR call? Uh, just starting out, we have to put defib packs on patients. Mm -hmm. Utilize our monitor, which is about a twenty-five dollars to $35,000 device. We then start with epinephrine as a medication. We have to get IV access. And sometimes when people are in cardiac arrest, they don't have very good veins. So we have to use a device called an I.O. and those are a few hundred dollars right off the bat. And then depending on what their heart rhythm is, sometimes we have to give a different type of medication or we might just use epinephrine all the time. But there's lots and lots of supplies. We usually actually use this table and it's stacked with the amount of supplies uh, for a life-threatening type of call. It's not abnormal to see a $1,500 bill for a CPR worth It's worth of supplies on my end. 1500 Those pads that we put on you that you see people in the movies when they shock them and they jump? Yeah. One set of those pads is $150, $175. For, for one use. One Throw use. Away. Throw away. Box of gloves, $20. And like I said, when they go through a call, they take them off and put another one on because when you get blood on your gloves or some red glove, the tube that goes down to people's throat, $50. The uh, epinephrine that she was talking about, it comes in, we call it a preload, it's a, a syringe that's already got it in it, right? That is uh, $200? I don't know. $150 to $200. The needle that, we, that she was talking about that we can stick in, in your leg, that needle alone is about half the size of this is $50. We don't get to pick the pricing on that. That is what the market charges us. So $1,500 is not uncommon to see for a CPR. Again, on the other side, there's some patients we just pick up and literally give her up. Okay. Paying for the price of diesel across town. So let's say $3.50 to haul. I don't know if that answers your question. Diesel. Yeah. Well, I'm saying, you know. Yeah. I, I, I was just curious how much. In addition to the wages. To the wages. You took the wages of that Yeah, and then like Corey mentioned earlier, you know, Medicare, Medicaid pays maybe $200 of that $1,500 bill. So, unfortunately, our business is not cheap and we don't get reimbursed for it very well. That's and of the supplies, it's not like we can say, oh, well, we, we don't use that medication, for example, very often. Let's not stop it. We have to, you know, because our yeah our county medical program director dictates what meds we have, as well as Washington State Department of Health dictates what we have in medication and just equipment in general. You know, we have to have X number backwards. Even though we routinely only transport one person at a time that might be on the backboard, we have to have a couple of them you know, because they say that's what you minimum equipment on the ambulance. So. You know, there are places where we have to maintain those certain levels and we can't cut back on. You know, so that to 
is it helps increase our, our operating costs. The cities have also taken advantage of a program called the Ground Emergency Medical Transportation Funding. And so it's state and federal funding that has been able to fill in the gap for Medicare. Medicaid. It's Medicaid. So yeah. it's able to fill in the gap, but that funding is planned to go away within the next three years. So when it comes to the city's availability fee that we're currently charging our residents or our citizens, the GEMT money is what it's called. It's been able to fill in that gap to where we haven't had to increase that availability fee. And just within the past year, we've seen a significant decrease in funding. And we were told just two months ago that the funding will be gone within three years. So that's another reason as to why you'll see an increase. In yeah, and so I hope I think our last year was what, 150,000 reimbursement, something like that? No. That's just for hope when I don't even know where Aberdeen City, obviously they have a lot of so it's probably higher than that, and that's going away. How about age out? You've got a way older population, and I'm part of that, and it's like in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and you've got people that retired 35 years old, 20 years old, whatever. You know, we, don't, we don't get the increases uh, like the population. Uh, is there any way to mitigate those costs to the seniors, the retirees, or uh, like the cost of the services? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, please, but I don't think we can charge different rates to different people. So the only thing we can do is offer discounts as far as on the uh, the property taxes the county does offer discounts on the utility fee, but when it gets to the actual fees we charge, we're kind of stuck having to have it, correct? Yes and no. So okay. there's the senior citizen discount rate on the ambulance availability fee. There's um, a senior uh, discount rate on your property taxes. You are correct as in we have to charge the same rates to everyone. However, I'm not sure in Aberdeen, but in Copeland we do offer a low income discount. Okay, but, um, but that's that's a point that right up to a certain point there's an income cut off after that. Then then So we use the federal, there's a, a federal status and we update it every year based upon what the feds recommend. And so like it gives us so if you have one income of five people in your house, like it sets an income standard for you. And so yes, it is a set amount, but it does increase based upon the amount of however many incomes you have in your home and people. Yeah, but if the county has a, has a cutoff on your, on your tax. For your the property taxes, tax. yes, you are yes. correct. Okay, but that goes up to how many thousand, like 40,000 or something, or it's based on people? It's, it's pretty low, but yes, yeah. I, I believe it's just based upon the income. Not so I mean, like if you're above that, then, then you pay yeah, so I mean, there, you are correct. Um, and the cities are the same way for their, our current discount, senior citizen discount program that we offer for our ambulance availability fee. But like I said, to where everybody with a low fixed income, they might be able to qualify for the actual billing discount program. Right. Once, I, I once the service is used and there's a bill, then there's another. That's at least that's for some time going down into the homeless camp. I've talked to a friend of mine that's at EMT, and we at times we we trust that they they go down the road. Yeah, they're, 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 if, they're, if they're available. It's, it's, it's not a mandatory. It's if they're it's able to for security for the patrol that they yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And that happens across the board in all three cities. That if something about the call doesn't sound safe or right. Uh, and hope when our officers will come and back us up in Cosmopolis, I know that their officers will back them up just for our safety. You know, the, the police know are trained how to handle people that are not being cooperative, <laughs> and our job is to help people that are injured or sick. So they will come. Uh, and, and actually, I'm thinking this applies to Cosmopolis as much as hope when is that the officers will come to give us a hand as well. 
Um, sometimes we just have don't have enough hands to do what we need to do, and so they'll come. Right. Yeah. Is that part of the package? Do you actually charge extra on that? No, that's that's just what they do. That's just what they do. Yeah. And just the on that thing is with us in, in every place. It's not just for that area. And if we we have certain places, you know, all three cities have certain houses that we know they we might want to law there. So it's not just because it's that particular area. You know, we have those things kind of spread out throughout our jurisdiction. Shoot, I'm over here. That's great. Over here. Uh, Aberdeen, you've got so much money budgeted right now for the fire departments. Yes. What's going to happen to that money if this passes and and it's, it's funded as an independent organization? Then, then all your uh, your retirement and your, your benefits and your and all that stuff is paid for through this, right? Through the RFA. The, R the, the retirement is through the state, but. Yeah. Right, but, but it's, it's you and not the state. Is that right? They, into the retirement or into the other parts? Well, like now you, like the city pays part of yours and you pay part of yours. Yeah, yes. Okay, so when it goes to RFA, how does that work? The RFA. Yeah, so it's the same retirement program. Right. So the benefits would just switch over to the RFA. It all, it all transfers to the RFA. Okay, so and the then, RFA would pay what the city pays and then you would pay your difference. Yeah, yeah. Same, yeah same as we do. And, and to de dig deeper into that, uh, as of today, there is no Central Grace Harbor Regional Fire Department, right? It's not an entity. It doesn't exist. Right. There's no commissioners. Right. They're not collecting any money. So if it got voted approved in April, it wouldn't start, because it's technically still not into uh, a, a legal entity until January 1st, 2024. So it wouldn't start collecting taxes until 2024. And Corey can correct me if I'm wrong, but the RFA would not see any money until April, May, June? Yeah. Somewhere there. Because you can pay taxes twice or you can't pay or pay them once, whatever you want to do it. So in that six month gap, the cities, all three cities would continue to pay their share to, to cover that until the taxes started being collected. Or not collected recently. Does that make sense? Yeah. So okay, that would just roll over. Yeah. Okay, but like the money that's what's what's or what's Oakland gonna do with their money? What's Aberdeen gonna do with their money? If you got the eight million, you know, bigger budget and you got four. There's not you're not creating more money if you're, you're reallocating yeah, money, so right? The, so oh, I'll let you hear the money. No, you're um, <laughs> you're nicer than that. But, but if you want to have the college, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're collecting so much, that sliver. It's just going to the RFA instead of to the city. So the city's not additionally still collecting that money. So this eight million budgeted right now is collected through these existing fees are just going to switch over to the RFA and be collected that way. It, it looks different how it's collected. It's the same theory, just about the same amount of money with that ambulance ability, availability, being going up slightly. But it's not the line item of the fire department within each city's budget. Is just no longer going to exist. Their overall budget's going to increase by that amount. So, so is our budget. The revenue is, the expenditures are, are all going to be transferred over to the RFA. Okay, but, but uh, the cities get tax revenue from multiple sources. It goes into the city. Part of that has to go into each department, right? Yes. So I'm saying that money there. But does the city end up with that money? No. So the the dollar fifty per one thousand. That's the property tax money that goes up to the RFA. So the property tax money that the city is getting currently, like collecting for the fire department, that's going to be taken away from the cities and moved to the RFA. The cities will not see that money anymore. So our expenditures are going to decrease because the fire department's going away, but our revenues are going to decrease by that much as well because that portion of the fire um, of the property taxes. I think another way to look at it is Avenue. There, what the city of Avenue gets from property tax is two thirty-five per thousand is the rate. It is going to decrease by one fifty 
that 150 then goes to the RFA. The city's property tax then goes down to 85 cents per thousand. So it just gets peeled out and it's a net zero. Did we answer that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the city of Hopewim would collect, the city of Hopewim in general collects, uh, let's say, $5 million for the entire city through okay. property tax. One million of that comes to me in the fire. Yeah, right, I know. I'm going high. Uh, one million of that is for me at the fire truck. Yeah. Okay? So come January 1st of 2024, when the RFA comes in, the city drops down and only collects four million, and I get that million off on the side. Does that explain it better? So they're not bringing in five million anymore. They're losing a million, and I'm taking my million and going to go play in another sandbox. And just for record, there actually is a cap on how much local governments can collect in property taxes. So the city just can't collect property taxes. I mean, they can't just, there's, there's a maximum that all governments, it's $3.50 that city or the local governments, in, which includes cities, school districts, fire districts, any local junior taxing district. Um, it's set actually by state law, it's an RCW. And so the cities can't just go out and collect whatever they want. So once the RFA takes that dollar fifty per one thousand, we can't ask for that dollar fifty per one thousand back. Right. But, but can the RFA raise raise that? So price? they could ask the citizens for an excess, like an M and O money, but then that would have to go out for voter approval. They can't just raise it just. If it only increases if the property tax increases, then that gives everybody a little bit more money. Um, not necessarily. So this it's is where property, property taxes. So property taxes get really confusing. So when it comes to property taxes, you can only ask for a one percent increase of the revenue that you're receiving the prior or that year. So if property taxes skyrocket. We can't ask for any more than 1% of what we're collecting. So we can't ask for money on that additional property tax assessed evaluation. We can only ask for 1% more than what we we're currently collecting. Okay, but say if it goes from 170 to 200, again, it's a $30,000 increase. So our property taxes are going to stay exactly the same but the ambulance fee is going to nearly double. Yes. yes. So we're going to go up to $2,400 a year on ambulance fees, but my property taxes stay the same. $2,400 a year. No. Well, I can say average is roughly $260, 280 Yeah. Are you in Hope? 200, 240 a year, sorry. Yeah, that makes sure. Yeah. Are you in Hope or Average? I'm Hope. Okay, so just for actually for reference for Hope, it's actually going to go down less. Um, to get even more confusing, Hopewim currently has an EMS levy. I know. That will go away. Okay. So I believe for Hopewim residents, it's an increase of, if you take into consideration the R, the um, EMS levy, it's an increase in the I'm just going off the numbers like that were on the form that you guys gave us. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's correct. So, but I'm just and, letting and you know. So that's what the average there. person out there is going to look at. Yes. Right. So if the EMS levy will go away, the 50 cents per thousand, so you'll quit paying that. Which that's in the, um, I think it's right, in the... Right, it is. But yes, it'll go up, whatever, whatever math was, I'm not going to, $240 a year. Yeah. It'll go up $240 a year. I don't know what your house is valued at, but you're going to lose it on the EMS levy. I don't know where your house is, I don't know... Well, the, the average house in Hope Wing is between seventy and 120000 So... So... I can't do that. I can't go right now. <laughs> so, I mean, if you want to call me tomorrow, I'd be more than happy to calculate it for you and give you an estimate. Well, I, I can figure it out. I'm just okay. trying to get everything straight. Yeah. So, because yeah, so, I, the, I, I talked to a lot of people last time around that they were unhappy about the money situation. Right. And that's what we're trying to. And that's what I'm trying to figure out. And I appreciate your questions. I, and I hope it doesn't come across like we're arguing with you. The, the, the big question I have, is, again, I go back to. Why can't we do fire? Why can't we do volunteers in Aberdeen and Hopewood if we're doing a new That is a possibility that with this plan, because.
because they have a program in place, we're trying to expand on their program. Because I've been a volunteer EMT and firefighter. Unfortunately, it is not, you're right, volunteer technically is doing it for free, but it's not for free. It's not for free. There, I know there's certain fees for it, but it's still a hell of a lot less than a union firefighter. It's, it's less, but it's not that much less. And nothing against volunteers. I grew up as a volunteer. I started. That's where I began the fire service. Um, with the paid guys that you see here today, they're here 24 7 and you are getting them any time of day or night, whether it be 2 o'clock in the afternoon or 2 o'clock in the morning. As a volunteer, Nick could probably speak for this, he has another job. He has a real job. So he can't respond at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And do you want to respond at 2 o'clock in the morning? With our call volume in, I'm going to separate myself from them, right? I'm just, we're just talking hopefully right now. Uh, 3,500 calls a year. That's a lot of calls. I, I understand. And, I was with Snohomish County. I knew a lot so of calls. You, yeah. I, I was a completely volunteer station out in the middle of the sticks. So you understand, exactly. So you understand that if you have to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and go to your real job. It sucks. It but sucks. You know it because you're a volunteer and you want to. Unfortunately, help. and I appreciate, how many years ago did you volunteer? It was 20 years ago. Okay. I started 30 plus years ago and stopped. 25 years ago when I got hired here. Today, Nick can talk to speak on this even more. Volunteerism in the fire departments, actually we have Chief Spradling from Fire District 6, he could probably speak to it as much as anybody. Volunteers don't happen as much anymore. People do not have the zeal to support their community the way they used to. Tim, Nick, speak up if, if I'm saying something not right. It is hard for them I mentioned earlier how it's hard for me to get a firefighter in here, and I'm trying to pay them. <laughs> they are having the difficulty to get volunteers to just come and do it for free. We all know it's not free, but for free. And that's happening not just across Aberdeen Copeland, that's the county, the state, and the country. Volunteerism across the country for fire departments is dwindling big time because Maybe it's a cultural, maybe it's a generational thing, I don't know. But in addition to that, volunteers are held to the same standard as, as current. I, I understand that. We have Absolutely. to have the same amount of training hours every month. We have to have, we're held to all the same requirements where these guys coming up have to know that the volunteers are at the same level with them so that we can play together. And it's a lot more hours. Every single year you're seeing more mandated training for firefighters. That volunteers can't keep. I understand. Yeah. I've been a volunteer. I've been National Guard. I've been. I. You want you want a lot of free time that gets sucked up. Join the National Guard. Because <laughs> yes. you really aren't paid right. for your training that you have to do every month. So again, nobody here would disagree with you with the concept of volunteers. But we have two chiefs here that could stand up and probably tell you how difficult it is for them to get, find volunteers. But, but if we don't offer it, you're never going to get it. Well, we have somebody offering it right next door in Cosmopolis, and we have somebody offering it right next door on the north side of town, and they're having difficulties. Okay. I, I will say that, when it, just speaking of volunteers in and of itself for the fire authority, one of the things that we have talked about is bringing Cosmopolis in as kind of the, the foundation, if you will, for the volunteer component of the RFA. Anybody in the RFA would be able to volunteer. You know, we'll be able to open it up to the boundaries and kind of have Cosmopolis be that hub, if you will, for the volunteer contingent. And I think time will tell what that response that is. And then if there's a great response, like I said, I, I just want to, know. I, I want to see it out there and open as an opportunity. So, so the volunteer concept in and of itself will be available. Now, how they're utilized is going to be dictated by numbers and the governing board. I understand. So, that. it's one of those things we can't look into the future and know for sure exactly what it'll look like. Uh, but just throwing it out there that it will be open. To the residents, they'll have an opportunity, and we'll we'll see where it goes. In fires, we were used mostly as firefighter rehab. Yeah, because we didn't have the day to day. Yeah. yeah, but that still opened up five people. 
yeah. that were full time reps. Yeah. Yeah, and again, we're no one's disagreeing with you, but our call volume, at least in Hopewim right now, isn't uh, super conducive to volunteers coming in and trying, trying. We have the fact that we can do a lot of your pickup calls. Yeah. So go pick right, this person up. Go pick that person right. up. Um, I hear those all the time. Yeah, those happen a lot. All right. What's next? Taking, I'm the target right here, right? And I'm the one who keeps standing in front. Oh, they keep moving to the side. They keep going out to the side. I'm sitting up here with a target. I didn't get bold like this. Yeah. I, I noticed that. There's got to be something to that. Can you take your hand up? Okay. I saw you up. I didn't want to have you miss an opportunity. Corey handled it. Okay. And so I guess just to add, since we got some downtime, is with this entire plan, bringing in Cosmopolis, the plan is to recruit more volunteers. Yes, we're trying, you know, the rates are going up, but we're trying to bring on four additional firefighters. Uh, one of those positions are for uh, what we call in Hope when the medical services officer, you guys call it the... Yeah, sure. sure. Close enough. Same, same. Captain Roar that's back there is our medical services officer. That is just one of her duties that she gets to handle, not only on duty, but off duty. Um, because EMS is 85% of our daily activities, we all have to be trained up to a certain level, and we have to hit so many hours of training per month, plus we have uh, how many classes per year do you have to hit? Three, four different classes, roughly? Mandatory classes? Uh, Twelve. Twelve? Yeah. For a well, yeah. outside of the monthly training, there's also uh, ACLS, Advanced Cardiac Life Support, uh, Pediatric Advanced Life Support, that they have to hit. And it's her job to make sure that each one of these guys sitting here are hitting those and going to the classes like they're supposed to to keep their certifications up to date. Up to date. Aberdeen has the same person doing a job in there, and Nick, Nick the, the chief, he gets to do it all in Cosmopolis to make sure all of his people are hitting all of those. So that one of those four positions is going to be the medical services or medical safety officer, because uh, let's see, we would be sitting 55 to 60 firefighters. Between all three of us, just shy, of just shy of 60 between all three departments. Somebody needs to make sure that we are, they are staying on top of their medical training. Fire training is a whole different thing. That's just medical. Plus, everybody has to maintain their certs. Plus, we have to make sure we're following rules. Plus, she actually sits on the county education board. Is that lack of a better term for it? Um, Larissa actually teaches multiple first aid and CPR classes. Um, two aspiring EMTs throughout the county. So that's where one position is going, is for that specific position, because that's going to be a full-time job just trying to corral the cats. Um, the other three positions would be entry-level firefighter positions. Uh, that is just to help try to spread the load across the board. In Hope right now with you, let's see, you don't count. You're not, you're not on duty. You have five people on duty. So all of our people in Hopewin and the majority of his people in Aberdeen are what's called cross staff. So if a medical call goes out right now and this station is going to take it, those two gentlemen standing in the back, Zach and Sean, are going to go take that call. But if they're sitting here in the station and a fire comes out, Sean, I believe Sean today, is getting off the ambulance and driving the fire engine. So they're cross staff, right? They have to go back and forth. What that ends up with is if those two are on a call, on a medical call, and a fire call comes in, Larissa is going by herself in that fire engine. Don't you guys have a two and two process too that you mentioned this morning? Yes, we do. Yes. I'll get to that in just a second. So uh, Larissa has been with us for approximately 10 years, and I think she holds the record for going to the most confirmed structure fires by herself. Because this ambulance has gone with two people, and the Station 2 ambulance has gone with two people, and she is literally going by herself 
to a fully involved house buyer. Luckily, we have agreements with Aberdeen, and they're coming. There's a couple extra minutes in there, right? One of our goals with this extra person would be to give her a driver that's here with her, right? And I'm using her because she's here day to day, whatever captain it is. With that, when we go to a structure fire, for us to be able to go inside and fight the fire, offensively or inside, we have to go in teams of two. Firefighters always work in teams of two. You have to go in with your partner, and as soon as you send two people in, you have to have two people outside. So there's four of my five people. Then I have to have somebody to pump, run the fire, be in command, get the water supply, blah, 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 safety. blah. Be a safety, all of that stuff. Um, obviously with mutual aid agreements, we can right. start to reach that, but that's where we need that two in, two out rule that comes into, into play like you said. That's where it all starts. That's where it all starts. So backing up to, like I said, with the additional personnel, the goal would be is to give this fire engine a second person. So that somewhere across this big RFA, we would at least have Two people in a fire engine, two people in an ambulance, almost everywhere, right? Almost everywhere. And then, um, you know, as time goes on and we gather more and more volunteers, they have to play by the same rules. Just because you're a volunteer doesn't mean you need to go in a house by yourself or go into a house without your pack. So, this is one of the things where it's uh, increased safety for citizens because we're trying to give you more people when your house if your house was on fire it's also increased safety for our firefighters so that one person isn't responding in an engine by themselves all right did that spur any more questions we got to have more questions somebody i think one of the things that i look at when we see the structure fires and they seem to come in cycles that they're all backed up well, that kind of thing that you get some quiet times that kind of thing and and really good examples, but I think a lot of people, maybe most people don't realize this, but I think a lot of people that are here today realize this, that we have these beautiful fire trucks that we can put in parades, and then we have those things that we put to work, yeah. um, and are constantly running, and we have going all the time. So having those plans, so that way when those are working, I can actually run one of those out to a structure fire and that kind of thing. Good so, I mean, it's just really good because we do get structure fires, even though that's most of the business right there. I will say, Aberdeen is lucky they have more manpower, they have more calls than us, they have more manpower than us on a daily. And so, yeah. they get to staff a fire engine every day, right? Pretty much every day? Yes, but as busy as we are, that cross staffing concept, even though I have people staffed that day on a fire engine, as busy as we are a lot of times, those people actually run an ambulance running another EMS call because my front out ambulance is out and my south side ambulance is out. We run approximately 51, 52% of the time where we have more than one call going on at the same time. So that's either two, three, four, five, six calls. And when we're getting up to five and six, we're screaming for help from, from Oakwind or from Fire District 2, or as far as even Montesino, or the beach or something. So, just because I have them staffed with a fire engine, because of how busy that side of the, the business is, they're not always guaranteed to be there. All right, who's shooting now? What's next? Yeah, I'm the target. I'm taking it. They, they keep moving out, yeah, what's that? They all keep moving further away from me. Anything else we can answer for anybody? Um, if we didn't answer your question tonight, uh, feel free to call any of us, stop by. Um, we are doing two more of these scheduled public informational meetings next Monday at the Aberdeen Fire Department on Market Street, West Market. And then the following Tuesday, which would be the 28th, we will be at the Cosmopolis Fire Department. Feel free to cross borders and go wherever you want to go to ask, 
them to, to see what we say over there because it shouldn't change. It will be the same presentation. Uh, maybe there will be different questions. Um, and we, again, the vote is on April 25th. The ballots we figured should be coming out, we were told, at the latest, the 7th of April, right? Yeah, three yeah. weeks prior. To three weeks prior. Um, is 18 days. 18 days. Um, so they might come out a couple days earlier, just depending on their mailing system at the county. Uh, and then keep in mind that I'm going to be hopeful here and say when it passes, or if it passes, uh, there will be a need for commissioners, three of them. So GRFA will be looking for someone to govern us and tell us what to do and how they would like to see us do it, just like city council members. So. You know, it's, it's another opportunity for oversight um, so that we're just not running amok and doing whatever it is that we want to do. There was city councilman before, right? There were two of them. So there, it's there, the, the original one said that there would be one person voted on from Abbey and Hope Quinn and then an at large between the two, and then city council members would be appointed. The current plan, because of the differences in disparities in population base between all three cities, it is three at-large positions. So from all three cities, and then each city council will, or city, yeah, city council, will appoint an elected official from the council to be a advisory member of the board. Non-voting, but advisory. That's gonna give each city a voice into the RFA either the mayor or one of the city council members. Yes, yeah, it, could be, it could be the mayor. Yes, yeah. an elected official from each city. Non-voting. Non-voting, yeah. I have a statement more or less on a question, is that okay? Please fire away. My name is Ryan Klein, I'm president of Local 315 Central Grace Harbor Professional Firefighters. And what that was, what that is, is the two groups that are the career firefighters from Aberdeen and Oakland. Back in June, we took upon ourselves to merge and be one union to help provide support and work through this process because we fully support uh, the merger of the two departments in the form of the RFA, just basic going off of the 2018 study that was done. The saying, what's going on between these two departments is not sustainable, and we see it day to day. The RFA, in our eyes, is the most sustainable option and will basically make your dollar go the furthest. These guys are worked hard. Guys and gals are worked hard. The Chiefs did a great job at referencing fire calls. We get a lot of fire calls. For some reason, these two cities get a lot of fire calls. We, we do as best as we can with the resources we're given. But I want to point out some statistics on the medical side. When you go into cardiac arrest and your heart's not beating, you have five minutes until we arrive to do life-saving interventions to save you. It takes seven of us to do that. Statistically proven, seven. Hoquiam Fire Department has five. Aberdeen Fire Department has nine. We run 50% 50 of the time when we have a call, there's another call. It's hard to get those numbers. Our goal is to get to your side in the fastest amount of time so we can do life-saving life interventions or help you in an emergency situation like a fire or a rescue situation. So I'm speaking on behalf of all the brothers and sisters of 315 that we fully support this, and we appreciate all the hard work the cities have done to make this plan a great plan in our eyes. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. All right, did that's for any questions? Anything? I know, I just keep reading it. I, I just keep looking. So, all right, well, I mean, if, if nobody has any more questions, again, feel free to contact myself, Nick, Dave, yes. Corey, who left. Um, Questions about your specific, your house, your assessed evaluation, and what the difference could be. Um, it's much easier than the previous version with the other chart we were talking about. I don't want to use that term because we've taken it away. Um, we understood from what we from what we heard, we we understood that it wasn't preferred, and it, it was an increase. It was a much larger increase than this. We've tried to scale it back, but we still need those extra people, so we've just scaled back the numbers of the extra people. Shouldn't say that extra addition. 
They're not extras. They're going to be put to work the day they step on the floor. Uh, How is it going to be three chiefs? So in the plan, the way it is written is that the commissioners, or let me back up, the planning committee, so each city has provided, every Hokeman have provided three city council people, the city of Cosmopolis have provided two, and the mayor, they have a lower five member council, so we have three of their members, now they have a quorum, so the mayor sits on the planning committee. If approved in April, that committee will appoint a temporary chief just to have that leader, leader moving forward. And then on January 1st, 2024, the commissioners will appoint from the current administrative staff, the chief and the two assistant chiefs. So it could be either one of us somewhere along the line. Um, <laughs> where are you going? Uh, with that, the, the organizational structure will include a, a chief, you need a leader, right? A, you need a mayor or a CEO or whatever you call it, and two assistant chiefs. Um, currently, I have not had an assistant chief, and Hopewim has not had an assistant chief since 2012 due to budget restraints. Uh, it's needed, you just can't afford it. Ryan is the current assistant chief and is contracted by the city of Hoquim as our fire marshal. So we are utilizing him uh, currently. Under those two assistant chiefs within the RFA plan, one of them would be an operations chief, oversee the operations. The other one would be a fire marshal or fire prevention chief that plan review, public education, fire marshal duties, all of that kind of stuff. And so, you, you have to spread the wealth. You are in the Coast Guard, you understand the chain of command and the, uh, your, uh, what's the word Span of control. Span of control, thank you, right? Can't give 100 people under one per person, you lose your, you lose your message and your span of control. So those two assistant chiefs would span out to handle the different functions that we're already doing. Like I said, Ryan is covering both cities right now as it is. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you everybody for showing up and coming. I uh, hope we answered your questions. And again, if you have any more, please contact any one of us. Thank you.